welcome everyone to the Columbia Leaders Experience. Kale is a series of virtual programs uh, designed to provide leadership development, as well as collaboration and camaraderie among alumni volunteers. Um, my name is Jason Horowitz. Um, I'm a, a Columbia College grad, uh, grad from 1986, uh, and I'm the president of the uh, Columbia Alumni Association of Seattle. Um, I'm also part of the Associations and Clubs um, Kale Subcommittee, uh, which is a group of leaders from around the world who work to ensure that you have a great kale experience. Um, we thank all of you for volunteering and for your leadership with the CAA regional alumni clubs and shared interest groups. Um, we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, Okay, we, uh, I was actually expecting a different slide that, uh, oh, no, there we go. <laughs> Special congratulations to um, our innovators and leaders who've continued to succeed in these very challenging times. Um, let's virtually put our hands together um, and clap for the 14 clubs that are mentioned on this slide. Um, Atlanta, the Black Alumni Council, Chicago, the Columbia Venture Community, uh, DC, the Columbia Fiction Foundry, Hong Kong, London, Mexico, New Jersey, Northern California, Sao Paulo, Singapore, and Southern California. Congratulations to all of these clubs. Um, we ready for the next slide. Um, we encourage you to register for um, over 40 programs over the next five weeks. Um, the kale lasts into November. Um, there will be opportunities for alumni clubs with high at attendance throughout Kale. Um, so we encourage you and, and other members of your board to attend uh, particularly these club and SIG programs every Tuesday. Um, timing will vary, so be mindful of the time zones. I'm really excited to introduce the, prevent, uh, the presenters for this session. Uh, Natasha Lebedeva, uh, 94 Journalism, is a CAA board member and a co-president of Columbia, D.C. Uh, and Ying Yen, uh, 95 Columbia College, is a CAA board member and vice president of the Asian Columbia Alumni Association. Um, and both of them are eager to share their insights with you. Um, a little more about each of them. Uh, Natasha is the Director of International Affairs at NBC News. Uh, she grew up in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, before graduating from the journalism school, she trained as a mathematician um, at St. Petersburg State University with a master's in structural applied and mathematical linguistics, summa cum laude. Um, Ms. Ying Yan is a founder and CEO of A Brighter Future LLC. Founded in 2007, A Brighter Future is a children's education business uh, dedicated to preparing today's children to become tomorrow's leaders. Um, Ms. Yen was also the executive director of Hong Kong Association of New York from 2011 to 15, responsible for managing the association's operations, membership programs, and finances. Hong Kong Association of New York is a nonprofit business association with members looking to develop opportunities between New York and Hong Kong uh, and via Hong Kong to mainland China. Um, so I am going to turn the um, speaking back over to Paul, uh, who will kind of lay out how, how this session is going to work. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jason. Um, it's really great um, to know that they are cutting the trees outside your apartment because I think that's very, your house is very important. Uh, I know that in California and the West Coast, it's very important to have healthy amount of trees being observed. So I really appreciate those wonderful introductions and also acknowledge Jason's wonderful work um, with the, K the KL subcommittee. We have about 20 different subcommittee members who have been really working hard to engage everybody. Um, so I'm just going to give some very short house rules for everyone. Um, so everyone's aware of what sort of the, how this program is gonna look. Um, so we're going to be having a uh, run of show is talking about identifying speakers, leveraging speakers and engaging speakers. 
Uh, both Natasha and Ying will be going over those topics. After we talk about that for a little bit, we're going to go into a Q&A session. And then after that, we're going to have breakout rooms so we can get a little bit of inter individual interaction between the different presenters um, in this group. Um, if everyone would like to add in the chat any questions you have, and it would be great to see the different people that are in our group. So if you wanna add in the chat uh, what your uh, club is and where you're uh, joining from, that would be really great to see the diversity of people coming from all around. So without ado, uh, I would like to pass it over to Ying and Natasha to start talking about the first topic, which is identifying speakers. And thank you again to both of them for taking the time to join us today. Well, thank you, Jason and Paul. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Just to give you a bit uh, more context, I've organized many events for different organizations over the past 25 years, including panel discussions, galas, conferences, uh, performing arts festivals, and sporting events. I've worked with speakers who are senators like Senator Chuck Schumer, governors, ambassadors, partners at major firms, entrepreneurs, young professionals, students, and young children. So what I share with you today is not just my experiences with Columbia events. Um, when I look to identify speakers, I usually have two approaches. The first one is there is an event that calls for a speaker. The type of speaker I'll seek out will depend on the nature of the event and the audience I'm expecting. For instance, a panel discussion on the current state of the US economy will have a different tone than a fundraising gala or a golf tournament, which is important to consider in identifying speakers. Um, the demographics of the audience will also play an important role in the selection of speakers. Oftentimes, I think people are always uh, wanting to find the most famous or successful person to speak at events in the hope of drawing um, a large audience. However, with alumni events, I find some of the most successful ones are the ones where the audience can really relate well with the speaker. For example, Asian Columbia Alumni Association will have events where young alumni and students get more out of hearing from professionals who are 10 years out of college than a senior executive or partner at a well-recognized firm. This particular audience can relate more with the younger professionals than the senior executives. Now, of course, we also have events where we do want these senior executives to speak um, to inspire and, and share their wisdom with our alumni community. As for how to go about finding speakers for specific events, I would suggest using your network of contacts, which I'm sure you all know. Also ask the board members and other leaders in your organizations to suggest potential speakers. It's usually good to have some event details ready when asking others uh, for their suggestions. Also, don't feel like you have to be the one to approach the targeted speaker. Um, it'll be more effective if you have the person who has the closest connection to the speaker to reach out on behalf of the organization. If you don't have someone with a personal connection, then consider having the most senior person in your organization reach out to that speaker. You can also use your contact at CAA to ask for help in connecting you to speakers. Um, the other approach I have in identifying speakers is always be on the lookout for good speakers at different events um, that I attend. In this case, I may not have a specific event in mind, but if I meet someone very interesting who has a wonderful story to tell, I will create an event for that individual to speak for our alumni. Being involved with Columbia as much as I am and uh, with other organizations gives me many opportunities to meet lots of fascinating people who are also articulate and entertaining. And that leads me to the characteristics I look for in a speaker. I don't care what the topic is. As long as you find a knowledgeable, articulate, and entertaining speaker who you have prepared well for the event, you will be able to capture the audience's attention. But how do you know if that person is knowledgeable, articulate, and entertaining? I try to see that person in action first by attending events or watching interviews of that person. If I can't do that, I'll ask around about that person's speaking uh, engagements. I look for speakers who can speak to the topics that are relevant to my organization and can relate to the community my organization serves or represents. Um, one additional thing I look for that may be particular to me is the speaker's ability to serve as a role model. 
I think this is especially important to the alumni associations we lead, as there are many young alumni and students who look to our organizations for role models. So um, I know my comments on identifying speakers are quite general, uh, but I've done so many events that uh, more specific comments may not be applicable to the type of events you do. So I'm happy to be more specific when answering your questions. Um, I'll, now I'll turn it over to Natasha. Thank you, Ying, and thank you, um, Jason and Paul, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone, and um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I think Ying completely, <laughs> um, you know, explained everything that um, uh, is good for identifying speakers for your club. And um, I would say we follow exactly the same uh, steps and rules um, and approaches that, that she explained. Um, I um, am a co-president of the Washington DC Club um, uh, of Columbia and uh, myself and uh, my co-president Kambis Rahnavardi, um, as um, well as Ing indicated, we are constantly on the lookout for interesting topics, interesting speakers and uh, you know possibilities for the club. Uh, DC Club is one of the 14 clubs that was awarded for the virtual programming you know, in these pandemic times. And um, I believe, you know, we, um, we work really hard in trying to find the best um, uh, webinars and best, best topics to offer to our alumni community. Um, I am myself a journalist, so I don't organize events or anything, but um, being a journalist, you have, you know, a keen interest in different topics and you meet a lot of people, you read a lot, you watch different programs and, uh, um, you know, I have a good eye, I guess, and a good sense of which topic is um, going to be very interesting for our audience and what is the uh, topic of the day and which people uh, will be the best to um, invite to participate in panels on those topics. Um, uh, and um, so I think what we're looking for when we think about the events for our club is you know, what is the current, you know, topic, what people are talking about and uh, in the news and everywhere, and what can we, who can we bring to address this topic for our alumni, com you know, community. Uh, we also um, always pay attention to different anniversaries, you know, um, of historical events or, um, you know, just, you know, global events uh, that we can connect our speakers to. And um, um, like there will be, the, for example, you know, the like hundredth um, uh, anniversary of, you know, some historic events. So we will think in advance, looking into like who would be the best um, speaker for, for that particular event, for example. Um, then um, we um, also think about sort of critical public service need, for example. You know, environmental protection is the topic that is um, very dear and very important to everyone. So apart from current events and um, the news of the day topics, we always, um, you know, think about uh, what are the, uh, you know, public service needs and uh, which topics we can include and which uh, speakers we can invite. Um, we are also always, um, you know, uh, working with the uh, Columbia, Columbia Alumni Association to find out um, which uh, uh, faculty members um, and former faculty members of Columbia, Columbia Alumni, if they're promoting uh, their work or their books in the media. And then we, you know, we usually like try to invite them if we think the book is interesting and um, uh, they can um, bring an interesting topic um, to, to our audience. Um, uh, and uh, we have, I, I'm sure like you may, might have the same in, in your club, but we have a special committee in our club. It's called Programming Committee. And uh, uh, it's a number of people who discuss in advance, like usually like several months in advance of uh, you know, different events that will be uh, possibly happening. Um, around the globe, and then we um, identify the speakers uh, for those topics. Um, and, um, you know, we have um, uh, board members and we always, uh, you know, have meetings and exchanges on uh, um, like who thinks which topic and which particular speaker, which book might be of an interest to, to our club. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's basically our approach. And we usually have now uh, several events a week that we host at our club. Um, and of course, virtually it's all different because previously we would also look for possibilities of um, different museum visits or um, 
art, uh, you know, art events or theater visits for our alumni clubs. But now virtually it's, it's more difficult in a way, but at the same time, it's more, it's easier because it's easier to get people to become speakers for your club when it's virtual and they're doing from their homes. It doesn't involve travel or something like that. Um, and then obviously like what Ing indicated in their searches that we have similar approach as well. Um, and I think, you know, maybe like if you have any specific questions, we'll be, I'll be happy to address them um, when we have questions and answers. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I think that both um, Ying and the Asian Columbia Alumni Association and what the Columbia uh, DC group is doing are they're really innovators. Uh, with able to leverage so many great um to leverage so many great speakers but i think identifying is the first point of contact so going into the next topic how do we leverage those speakers um, to take it to the next level so i will pass it back to both of you Ying, you, i think you wanted to start oh, first i was gonna say do, do you want to go first this time oh, okay sure yeah. <laughs> Like, um, now use that you are going first all the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Otherwise, I'll be saying too much. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. So um, how do we like take, so we identify the uh, speakers, you know, following the uh, approaches that Ingrid indicated that we also use, as I said, and uh, uh, if we think, um, you know, somebody is an amazing person, um, we try to um, use our, you know, clubs, former successes and former events um, as some um, sample or example of how we can approach this particular person's or speaker's event, um, you know, in the future to um, increase their interest in participating. Um, we, you know, we usually write a very, um, you know, powerful email um, to the contact of that particular person or to the person himself. And uh, usually it's written by me or Cambis. Um, and, but we run this email through a couple of uh, board members uh, just to get their feedback because very often, you know, I would think, you know, this approach is better than another one, but then there will be a board member who is more familiar with the area uh, of uh, where the speaker is involved and have, um, and, the, and that, you know, board member has better suggestions to us. Um, so we just, you know, we write a, a very powerful letter. We include our website. And if you go to the Columbia DC website, I think, um, we find it very helpful and successful because we have, um, you know, information about our club, about our board members, as well as uh, uh, events that we had in the past and upcoming events. Um, and we spent a lot of time, um, you know, working on our website using different descriptions. Um, our previous events, the descriptions of our previous events usually um, help us in getting the, the speakers because, um, we um, do a big write up about the event. We include buyers of the, uh, you know, the previous speakers and the moderators with photographs. We include some pictures there. So we make it very entertaining and very, you know, engaging. So I think, um, you know, if you spend time with description of the events and the website, it will attract more attention of the potentials of the potential speaker. Uh, we usually um, are trying to be to book things in advance, uh, give people flexible time frame, um, and work with them. Um, and of course, I mean, as always, in uh, um, when you go for a, for a work interview, or whatever you do, your homework, you do research on that person, and include something personal in um, in in your in your letter or email when you approach them. Um, also very important uh, for every event is finding not only the speaker, but the right moderator, uh, because that will make um, uh, an event even more attractive to the potential speaker. You know, if the speaker knows that he or she will be interviewed by some, you know, well-known correspondent or some person connected to the media, they might be more interested, or if they know this like that moderator has a following on social media, uh, they understand that the event will be promoted on uh, different platforms. So, um, so that's, that's what we usually uh, do when we try to leverage the speaker. And obviously we often use, uh, you know, uh, as Ian indicated personal connections. We ask around if anybody knows anyone. So you do like this chain reaction thing, you know, like, oh, I know this person who might know the other person. 
and then you use those connections uh, because when it's um, uh, when you can refer to somebody who suggested you approach that person, it usually works much better than just a cold approach. Um, so now I give it over to Ying. She probably has even more insights. No, I couldn't agree more with all that you said. So I think my comments now have been cut in half. <laughs> <laughs> um, we cut each other in half. <laughs> exactly. That's okay. It's more time for a breakout session. So um, I would just add that you can leverage not only the past events, but also past speakers. Um, they can recommend new speakers for you. Uh, so past speakers know what you expect and the quality of your program. So they are a great resource for identifying and bringing in new speakers. Um, also, through your speakers, both uh, past and present, you can engage more alumni by asking your speakers to bring their network of friends to the events. Uh, for instance, ACA has annual events, so we invite past speakers to come back and bring their friends. Uh, just make sure you've made the speakers feel welcomed in your community and in your organization, um, and that you've addressed their needs for the events they spoke at. They, the way you treat them will be what they tell their friends. So don't just use speakers for the events you want them to speak at. Treat them well, and um, they will be some of your best ambassadors uh, for your organization. Another point um, I'd like to make is uh, to ask speakers if you can use their firms or facilities to hold the events, another way of, of leveraging um, speakers. So in some cases, like law firms and banks, they may be willing to host the event and even cover the costs. However, you know, nothing, there's no free lunch in this world. Uh, this may depend on what you can offer the firm in terms of the number of participants you expect and the type of audience you will bring. Um, I also try to learn about what organizations, what other organizations the speakers are involved with and what other interests they have, because you never know how useful that information may be in the future for other events and initiatives or how useful it may be in your personal career development. Um, you know, one last point I want to make, and it kind of ties in with what Natasha alluded to earlier, you know, we can leverage technology now to reach speakers and audiences. Obviously, during this pandemic, we've all used technology to work with people, and in my case, speakers across the world, and reach a much broader audience. While this technology um, has been around for a while, the adoption and the use of it was not prevalent until more recently. So. People are now more comfortable doing virtual meetings and events. It is now more acceptable as a means of communications and as a means of doing business. So we can build on this new norm to further um, identify and engage with speakers. That's all I have to add to uh, Natasha's comments. Yeah, I think uh, we have, um, I mean, the last thing we wanted to discuss is engaging, you know, like, when you identify speakers leverage and then engaging with them. So do you want to me to start uh, in or? Um, up to you. Yeah, if you'd like to start, that's fine. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, like as soon as you get, uh, you know, a yes from a particular speaker on the topic and you already have a moderator, hopefully, uh, or if you don't, then you leverage a uh, speaker with a moderator, not the other way around. Um, and as I've indicated before, it's better to um, start the engaging process and identifying everything and organizing everything like a couple of months in advance. Um, and uh, uh, in your and we usually like continuously keep in touch with um, the speakers and moderators and their I mean, perhaps their representatives um, um, a, a, as well, communicating details, uh, provide as much information as we can. Uh, we often help them uh, identify the topics of discussion and sometimes discuss even the questions with them just to make it more easier and uh, for, uh, for the engagement as well as um, to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of which topics we think would work better for our audience. Um, and um, uh, so we, like, we work directly with the speaker or the representative of the speaker and maintain the communication until the day off or the hour of the event. Um, and then of course we, you know, we thank them and, um, um, and always try to see if we can approach them in the future or as Ing suggested, you know, they become, if the event is successful, they become your best advocates and they have uh, suggestions for other possible, you know, interesting people to approach or topics, um, you know, or, or, or topics to use in, in the future. So, uh, 
but again, like it's professional and constant communication, but not overburdening um, and, um, you know, maintain it until the event and uh, keep in touch after the event as well. Yeah, um, we do the same. I, I completely agree with everything that Tasha is saying. Definitely keeping our um, speakers involved in the whole process from beginning to end in terms of giving them as much information as possible, the audience, uh, demographics, how many people to expect, the format of the event, other speakers that might be speaking, and of course, talking points, um, all of which will help the speaker prepare his or her talk. Uh, always check in with what audiovisual needs that they may have. I usually give speakers the run of show so that they're not in the bathroom or taking a call when it's their time to speak. That has happened to me before. <laughs> Sometimes uh, with elected officials, they may not tell you what time they'll show up for security purposes. I uh, remember I had a Lunar New Year celebration with an audience of almost 3,500 people and multiple speakers and entertainers, including uh, Senator Chuck Schumer. I didn't know what time he was arriving because his office didn't want to share that for security purposes. So I had to be flexible with my run of show. His office calls me five minutes before he arrives at the event saying he's arrived. So he arrives and wants to speak immediately. And so then I had to move things around in my program on the spot. Mind you, the program is halfway through already. And uh, needless to say, that was a very nerve wracking experience. So I've since learned how to work in different ways with different speakers to be very flexible, um, but organized as well. Make sure you inform everybody there will be some chaos. Um, one other thing I've learned is that uh, you need to be very nice to the schedulers, the chief of staff, the assistants, the receptionist, because they are all gatekeepers to the speakers. Um, I will also add that I also make it a point to ask the speaker what he or she would like out of the event. They'll usually say they just wanna give back to the community or support the mission of the organization. Um, I'll ask if there are specific people they would like to meet at the event and I'll share who I think will come. If there are people they would like to meet, um, I'll set up the proper introductions at the event. At some events, I'll even organize a private meeting before the main event for speakers to meet with VIPs. So throughout the planning stage and during the event, you know, I believe it's important that the speakers feel taken care of and welcomed. Uh, like Natasha said, do remember to thank the speaker, maybe even give a gift as a token of your appreciation. Um, like Natasha, follow up, stay connected. Um, I usually follow up with an email to share photos and feedback from attendees. Uh, to continue to engage with speakers and further involve them with my organization, I invite them to other events uh, so that as they get to know our, my organization better and the people in it, they could help in other ways, such as be judges for contests, offer venues for us to hold events, and possibly become board members or advisors. I have uh, one final thought about engaging speakers, and that's um, try to think about engaging young alumni volunteers to be speakers. Train them, give them opportunities to speak at events. You can start with having them be welcome ambassadors at events, then have them do introductions. And later on, maybe they'll MC an event. Many of our young alumni will go places and be very successful as they progress in their careers. You might as well engage them now so they'll be willing speakers for you in the future. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ying. Thank you, Natasha. That was really wonderful. I think um, I know that we're not all here in person, but I want to do kind of a virtual round of applause for a really wonderful um, speaking points on that. We're going to be going into the Q&A session right now. Uh, before we transition into that, I just want to acknowledge another one of our wonderful subcommittees, um, the communication subcommittee, which we have some subcommittee members, Alex, Stephen, and Esther, who's joining us. They created a handbook of best practices around communications. And if you do not have, if you can leverage, identify, and engage speakers, you still need to communicate out what's happening. So I encourage many of you, maybe after the call, to check out the link I just shared on communications best practices, because without sharing out the message and getting the people to show up, that won't, you know, you need the the audience to show up for those speakers and I appreciate everyone showing up today. Um, I like to open it up for questions. 
to for from everyone here we're going to have about a 10 minute period we're asking questions and then we're going to use some breakout rooms so you can interact with ying and natasha a little bit more directly um so does anyone have any questions that came out through this wonderful session so far you can add the questions in chat too if you're um, maybe it's easier for you to use chat versus speaking um i have a question paul uh, can you hear me yes go ahead dominic please this is Dominic. Um, so a great session, uh, you know, kudos to uh, both speakers. Um, but I, I, wanted, I had a question for you um, in terms of CAA, uh, the home office. Um, when I was at J&J, &J, we had a speakers bureau at uh, various operating companies uh, where um, speakers would be vetted. Uh, in, in many cases, these were for CME purposes or promotional. Uh, purposes, but um, you know there was sharing of the speakers bureau across operating companies if it was uh, if it made sense. So I was just wondering if there was some central database uh, that was maintained, uh, and if there isn't, you know maybe maybe you should consider that. I think each group has their own somewhat of a database. I mean, people do have access to the people that they know in their own community. Um, if you're talking about Dominic for like faculty or something like with around Columbia faculty, I just re recommend everyone to work closely uh, with whoever your liaison is within your group. Um, there not, are so many. Go ahead. Not specifically faculty, but uh, for example, um, you know the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, if you have a, um, uh, a physician or researcher uh, that is knowledgeable about the area, th that would be, um, you know, uh, it, it may be a, a speaker that could be, uh, you know, uh, at, at regional clubs uh, or regional chapters, you know, uh, something that would um, uh, be relevant and, and could be shared among uh, clubs. It, you know, it depends on the speaker, obviously. Um, and, you know, if they're willing to travel and there's not much travel these days, but it could be done through Zoom. Um, I think that there's different ways for lists. Like we, if you're talking about your alumni community, the, the CAA does have access to different groups of people. So let's say someone works in finance or someone works in um, healthcare or different things. We can work, you know, with with you in your in your own community to try to identify some people. Again, it depends on. I think what Ying and Natasha were speaking a lot about was th there are obviously a lot of people in the world, but sort of leveraging some personal connections that you have with people really allows you to get access to that. And I think both both of those groups are very, uh, you know, successful in sort of using leveraging those connections. So I think. A combination of you know if you want to work with for your for your group if you want to work with someone like myself um, to identify healthcare professionals maybe in your area that you might want to reach out to to see if they're willing to speak because I think I think you're right someone from your local community even if they're not um, a Nobel laureate someone who's an important person in the local community is an important person to speak to and people are more accessible um, now than more than ever in Zoom, it's very difficult for people to say, no, they can't do something because what else are they doing but staying home? Um, so I think that there's there's sort of an accessibility factor now, but um, I think that's a really great question. And I wanna just open up the platform. Does anyone else have any uh, questions right now? Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. Paul, I see some questions in the chat. Um, okay. One question is, are the speakers ever paid? Do we have a budget to cover their expenses? I can speak for ACAA. Um, from my knowledge, uh, and I've been involved with ACA now uh, a long time, um, probably six years or so. Uh, I don't think we've ever paid any speakers. Um, we have the budget, I guess, as ACA has, you know, we have our own reserves. So I guess if it ever came to that, we probably could pick up the expense. Um, do we have a budget to cover their expenses? Again, I think. I will dare say that we would probably cover ACAA um, if we had to, but so far we haven't uh, had to. And I don't know, Natasha, do you want to? Yeah, we never pay for the speakers. It's more like, you know, we promote their, them, their books, perhaps, you know, their previous work, 
Um, we uh, There were a couple of occasions when we would pay for a train ticket from New York or, for example, or, or, or Philadelphia, like it kept, happened a couple of times. But usually, no, it's more, you know, goodwill and uh, sharing the ideas and, um, you know, the experiences. And uh, uh, if it's an author involved, we usually promote their books. And if it's an in-person event, we organize, um, you know, from the book, book publisher, we receive the books and we sell them at the events, uh, you know, for, for the author, basically. And sometimes the author will, you know, authorize, like, the, write uh, an autograph, uh, autograph a book. Uh, but as far as, um, you know, speaker payments, no, we, we never do that. It's, um, I think it's a different approach here. Um, I think we have a question from Jose Colon in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. Would you like to ask the question, Jose? Yes, thank you. Um, hi, Jose Colon with uh, Columbia Alumni Association, Dallas, Fort Worth. And uh, thank you, Ying and uh, uh, you know, Natasha for your excellent presentation. So, you know, with um, our club is uh, uh, less active this year than, than we have been in previous years. Uh, we're focused much more on virtual events at this point, and we ex expect to continue to be through the end of this calendar year. Um, that said, uh, it's an interesting point on bringing uh, speakers to bear for you know, continuing activity for uh, for the club. And so uh, the Chuck Schumer uh, use case or, or experience was a, a great one to share because it kind of highlighted in my mind the need to uh, for um, as much preparation as possible. So uh, the, uh, the question I have is how do you organize and how best to execute a rehearsal, if you will, or a dry run uh, if the speaker's um, schedule will permit, uh, that could be used to resolve any unforeseen technical issues that might be difficult to resolve at the time of the event, uh, but also might uncover some uh, preparation that the uh, speaker had not previously anticipated. So what are your thoughts and what is your experience in that area? Natasha, I'll yeah, as, as far as the virtual events go, we usually uh, schedule, um, as, you, as you suggested, a rehearsal uh, call about a week in advance um, with uh, the speaker and the, whoever works with the speaker. So we'll do like a test Zoom and then uh, just to make sure everybody knows how to connect and how, you know, how it looks and which buttons to press, so to say. And then uh, usually on, on that Zoom, we go over the topic or the questions and the format of the meeting once again. So then basically, like, as you said, it's a rehearsal. Um, with um, in-person events in the, in the past, it's more just, you know, emailing the, all the details and, um, uh, you know, format of the event. And, you know, basically like you will be at this venue, there will be a stage, there will be a prompter, there will be like a slide possibility of using slides. Um, and then, you know, you speak for so many minutes and we can cue you, you know, like tell you when it's uh, the time is up and then we'll offer questions and answers and we explain how like one of us will have a microphone and we'll go around the audience giving the microphone to you, the people, you know, who will be asking questions. So we'll go all over all the details, but via email uh, or, you know, on a phone call. Just that's, a follow up. Approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Natasha. So just a, a follow up question to that. Do you have any experience with hybrid events? That is to say, uh, events where people are um, attending in person, but there's also a simulcast, so to speak, to uh, a virtual audience. We haven't done it um, yet because like we only hosted in person events prior to March. Uh, and then we switched into the virtual events. So we have not done the hybrid, but I think, uh, you know, the, like this pandemic changed things dramatically. So when we go back to whatever normal, new normal would be, that might be a possibility. But also because I think it just gives you more opportunities because as we know now, the speakers um, are not always available to come to you, to your like place of residence and, uh, uh, if it's an important speaker, you might, and I think it, it's actually a good idea in the future to offer the hybrid approach, like you'll have one speaker, uh, you know, here and then, you know, some audience and some other speakers will be virtually, um, that will give you more opportunities and uh, um, 
like approach more interesting people, I would say. It, I'm just thinking out loud after you ask this question, it actually makes sense now. <laughs> and people are so used to that, so they will welcome that. While before it might have been too weird for them. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to chime in on the hybrid. Um, so I think there's an opportunity going forward to do more of that proactively. Um, that way we can connect to a broader audience. So why not? You know, if we have the technology, uh, when we go back to in person, very much like Natasha, you know, in the DC club, ACA had done all in person programming before COVID. And now we're doing all virtual haven't done the hybrid yet, but I see there's a huge opportunity going forward to do that. And I guess I'm learning from my kids' um, school. They are doing hybrid models. So I'm kind of learning from them where some kids are in person in class and they have a camera set up and the kids are home are learning at the same time. So I feel like I'm learning from their experience. So I think there's a good opportunity in the future. Um, I had a point about the, how do you do a dry run with speakers to assure technical um, issue resolution. Sometimes you just can't get the speaker on for a rehearsal, whether it's a week in advance. Um, you can do maybe just 20 minutes or half an hour right before you know, the yeah. event, of course. Uh, but also I find it really useful to get all their slides well beforehand. A lot of times the technical issues fall in the slides or, or the videos they wanna play. You can work that out first with your own team. And then when the speaker comes on, you know, they may have audio or sometimes video problems, but at least you don't have to worry about the slides. Um, and the worst case scenario is they just call in. At least your slides are up, but they just call in and comment on their slides. Um, so, and be flexible. You know, I think everybody will be accommodating and understand. So those are just a few comments I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ying and Natasha. I think this is the time when we're going to go um, to a transition into the breakout rooms, which is a great opportunity for you to connect uh, more directly with Natasha and Ying. Uh, we're going to be going out for seven minutes each um, into each one of these breakout rooms. We have about 20 people in each room. Your, your rooms will be Natasha's breakout room and Ying's breakout room. And then we're going to bring everyone back and send you back out into the opposite room so you'll get to interact with both of them for seven minutes each. So I'm going to send everyone out into the rooms. So if you could just accept where you're being sent. Um, and then I think uh, Ying and Natasha will lead for introductions for everyone can connect with each other. So we'll see everyone in seven minutes. Uh, no, you don't join. You don't have to join. Let me just, I'm assigning some people right now. Um, one second. Um, Lou, I'm, I'm assigning you to a, one of the rooms. You just need to accept um, to where sent to uh, Ying's room. Um, and I think if everyone can accept, uh, the staff members, you don't, are not required to accept uh, that if you want to stay in the main room. Lou. Okay, Lou sees it, uh, Peter um, or Roni. Um, if you want to accept that, you'll be going to the room. If you do not accept it, you'll stay out in the room and talk with us. Um, the same for you, Shelly, just so you know. You should get a pop-up screen so we can send you out there. Um, I'm just going to use the, um, I'm going to start my timer. Amia, I'm just going to use the restroom briefly um, and I'll be right back, okay?
everyone's probably not wanting to come back into the room just yet. Uh, Courtney Wilkins is joined. Hi. Hello. Hey, Courtney, good to see you. You too. We'll be getting everyone back in the room shortly. People are coming back. We still another few seconds, I think 21 seconds counting down. Yeah, apparently I accidentally left my room. So there you go. <laughs> but hi. I, I like to give people the 60 seconds so that they can contemplate when they want to come back versus cutting off conversation. Um, no, like I was there and then I accidentally pressed close, but I thought I was closing the chat, but it closed the room. Well, I'm glad you're back. We're gonna we're gonna switch um, the the speakers here. Um, Natasha and Ying are gonna go into two different rooms. So let me just quickly change people over, and we'll be sending you out shortly. I hope everyone's enjoying the breakout rooms. I feel like the the TA in my uh, graduate class. Uh, one second. So while Paul does that, I want to share a question that was brought up in my group, which I thought was a good question. Um, you know. We are so used to inviting or prompted to invite alumni to be speakers. Um, why not consider inviting people who aren't alumni? And I, for ACAA, um, I don't see why we cannot invite people who are not alumni, as long as they are serving our alumni community and bringing knowledge, connections, uh, feedback that would be useful for um, our community. So that's one thing. And the other was, um, you know, when you have someone constantly coming to you and say, oh, can you provide a platform for this speaker or that speaker, uh, my cousin or so-and-so, and if you feel you don't want to have that speaker, I'll be very blunt here, uh, you can fall back on, well, my committee, you know, have a committee who makes a decision about who gets to speak. My committee doesn't think this would be appropriate at this moment, you know, always leave an open-ended, like maybe down the line, but at the moment, um, we're not able to accommodate. So I thought that was interesting to share. I think that's a great question, and I don't not to speak for Natasha, but I think that the DC group does a wonderful job with co-sponsorships with other other Ivies, where they get other speakers that might not be Columbia alumni, but they might be Harvard or they might right. be from Berkeley or Ivy Plus, um, and of course, um, Columbia alumni want to hear from speakers who whoever is a great speaker. So there's no restrictions on that. But Natasha, do you have any points on that that I didn't cover? Yeah, we have uh, specifically reached out to all the Ivy clubs here in, in Washington DC area and stayed in close touch with them and uh, we exchange our programming, you know, information and then when we think we, you know, the, our club might benefit from events at other Ivy League clubs, then we, you know, try to con sponsorship and go promote and do uh, joint events and they have been very successful with great attendance and uh, we broaden, you know, possibilities for our audience by using uh, amazing speakers from other clubs as well. But we try to have a speaker from Columbia at the same time. Right, we always concentrate on a lot, like on Columbia, some Columbia connection. I, I think the DC group is really good also that they get a journalism alumni, similar to Natasha, to be the moderator or the interviewer of a very high level speaker so that there still will be a Columbia connection, but maybe the main speaker might be someone different. But within the program, either with the introduction or the interviewer or the speaker, there is a Columbia connection within the larger group. Um, just to give time, I'm going to send everyone out to the breakout rooms again, and then we'll be going out there for about six to seven minutes and coming back in. So thank you, everyone. You just uh, accept the, the request. Let's see.
Hey, Paul, I think I got disconnected. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I mean, that does happen from time to time. I know with your connection, yeah, you get, you're down the phone, so it works out. I mean, yeah, and then I could just stay in this room. It's okay. Um, yeah, it was interesting because I got, I was, I can hear the audio for the breakout room with oh, Yang, okay. but then, um, they're you know, all, joining they're on. All, they're all coming back now, Patty, I think so. Yeah, they're com- yeah that's how I was like, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> it's wonderful to see everyone. Um, I'm glad. I know that that breakout session was not as long um, as the previous one, but uh, we were trying to balance it all out. So I want to leave um, the final word of closing uh, with our two wonderful presenters, uh, Ying and Natasha. Uh, I know that you probably learned a lot of wonderful jewels in those breakout rooms. So would you like to uh, finish us off, uh, starting with Natasha? Yeah, thank you everyone for joining and uh, for having brief conversations. And uh, you know, it's always good to know the names of the people for the future connections. Uh, one of the questions, like the last question in my last break, breakout room was from uh, London uh, saying maybe CAA, it would be a good idea for CAA to have like a master list of all the club's events and then other clubs can dig into there and see what <coughs> might be of interest to them um, and then connect with that clubs and you know cross promote and use them and do joint events basically or join other clubs events. Uh, I don't know whether that database exists, but if it does, that will be an amazing opportunity for everyone you know, on this uh, call and uh, uh, for the future to be working together, which will be beneficial for um, all, all the clubs, I think. That's a, that's a really great point. I know that there is something on the main CA website, but I think something around speakers um, that would be you know, for special events and opportunities. I think that's a great idea and great feedback from London. Uh, Ying, would you like to, uh, any final comments yeah. that you learned? I just um, am thrilled to meet a lot of you and to see some familiar faces and meet new ones, especially from all around the world. Uh, I was saying earlier, it never ceases to amaze me how great the Columbia Connection is and to be able to see so many people. Um, and I really want to use this pandemic to look for silver linings. And I think one of the silver linings is truly we're able to be more connected in some ways um, as a result even though we're isolated individually. So um, I kind of want to part with that, that thought of unity and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world besides just COVID. Um, so I hope that we can you know, together do a lot more to advance a lot of different causes and we can come out of this COVID uh, kind of stronger for it. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you everyone. And and I and I wanted to just also highlight that Natasha is going to be speaking again for us um, for for the Columbia Leaders Experience on Wednesday night um, at seven p.m. with uh, Jody Cantor and Matt Bai. Uh, do you want to give any of us a preview if people are not signed up yet, Natasha? Um, yeah, it's a sort of like a media journalism panel uh, discussing. Uh, the role of media in, uh, you know, covering politics and current events. Um, I think we'll be all addressing fake news there and uh, bring our approaches and, um, uh, you know, in-depth discussion of uh, the role of media uh, in this world. Thank you, Natasha. And then next Tuesday um, on the 27th, we are also going to be having um, another one of these clubs in six programming for Kale, which is called Creating and Maintaining Organizations That Are Truly Inclusive. Um, and that will be have Courtney Wilkins, who is joining our call today, um, Elisa Charters and uh, Sitara Hinur. So there'll be some wonderful speakers next Tuesday. And that, that call will be at 8 p.m. at night, um, Eastern Daylight Time. That is a, a really acknowledging our friends on the West Coast so that they won't have to get up really early like our friend to, to thank everyone, Jason, who got up um, at 8.30 a.m. on the West Coast to join us to be the person who gave the introduction. So thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Ying. And thank you, Jason. Everyone have a wonderful day and take care. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Paul from Jersey. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.